Hey everyone, how are you? It's uh, early morning for me, for you, but late night for me. If I drop dead asleep here on the stage, don't bother me. I will just sleep. Just carry me somewhere, and I will sleep there. Okay. <laughs> um, today, I want to talk about sustainable architecture. Uh, it's a really um, a biggest topic. What is sustainable, and what is architecture? Um, I will start with introduction about who am I. Um, that question that everyone probably asks themselves often. <laughs> um, I started working with Rails later than Akira, unfortunately for me. Uh, I started with Rails 1 something, um, and I, during the years I accumulated lots of books, uh, a little bit of experience, so don't judge me for that. Uh, I like to speak on a stage, and I like to speak with people. I really like hearing problems that people can face in their everyday life or is there everyday software engineering. So if you have some problem that you're struggling right now, find me, I would like to talk with you and maybe help, maybe make your problem, problem even worse. So not, and I can't promise you anything. <laughs> um, as I was said, I work right now for Shopify. Um, I was working on various companies before. Um, so if you want to embrace the winter and really feel what snow looks like and feels, uh, talk to me. <laughs> um, because in Canada we have lots of snow really a lot of snow. We have a special rod for snow. Um, uh, today, I want to talk <laughs> uh, today I want to talk about what's, what's driving application farther, how we can grow our application with time, and what is, the, what is the main problems that we may encounter during the web application development. Uh, this talk, unfortunately, not about how you can build the perfect plane, even though I would like to hear talk about uh, perfect planes. Uh, this talk not even about the flying chair. Uh, you can put a fan to your chair and pretend it's flying, but uh, this talk not about it. Um, and it's not about microservices uh, and not about distributed monolith. Um, however, it's all about that um, and things in between about that. And I will explain why. Um, usually when you, when someone have an idea, an idea is to build something and to make a project. You, we feel from outsiders, as idea came to success, we know only successful stories, but we rarely know about stories that end up badly and like, or get down. However, lots of us work on a project that not, not in a production anymore. Like, at least me, I work on few of them. <laughs> uh, because the ideas and success usually looks like this. You have lots of problems on your way and you're trying to undertake those problems. As you underta undertake those problems and you face those problems, you're trying to build a solution. Those solutions, they are not general. They're usually custom because your problem is custom. Because the thing that you, you do in, and you do right now for your project is something new to the market, is something new to the world, and those your problems are also new. And your solution to those problems are also new. And I rarely hear a phrase from people that we're running this new project, awesome idea, and we're running it right now, but only for three weeks. And after three weeks, we're shutting down the application, we don't want to work anymore. People usually think and think in the future, they want to build application that will last for years, that will help and solve certain problems for people. And as you solve the problems and you accumulate more features, and you accumulate more solutions to your problem, you grow complexity. And as you grow complexity, you also accumulate lots of bugs and lots of, and lots of solutions that are custom for you. As you start, or as you're only starting your application, you're thinking about, well, it's a Greenfield project, I can use whatever I like, I will use the edge, um, edge case uh, technologies, and I will make it definitely the, the best thing at a time, at my time. And then you finish in the project, or you're like in midway of your project, and you're seeing that, uh, looks like I have a lot of things that I made incorrectly, and I need to fix them. But, you, but rarely you get in back and you're fixing the problems. You're still building your perfect plane, and you're still building things on top of the existing, uh, existing application. And as you build it, you accumulate the dependencies. Dependencies could be external dependencies, like your database, your certain APIs that you consume, your certain webhooks that you use, or certain technology that you're using. But also it could be internal dependencies. As the application is growing, 
lots of modules that you're using inside, they are dependent to each other, or they dependent in a general way. And dependencies, when you see this massive dependency and massive things, and you're trying to fix something, and you're trying to like make a new feature, you're trying to make certain adjustments, you're actually creating more problems. And by creating more problems, you end up in a mess like that. Uh, and this is a mess, uh, honestly. I don't know how you can work on this. Like, if you need to do something, it will take you years to figure out at least what's going on. And um, dependence is often, I'm not sure if it will work though. Yeah, looks like it works. Um, dependencies and, um, and the work with that is like, it's like you're an operator on a moving train. Your train is moving, your application is working. You have customers each second, thousands of customers each second. And you see that you are undertaking a problem in front of you. And now you're on a moving train trying to fix the problem. Um, and changing the wheels on a moving train, it could be a really hard things to solve. <laughs> uh, and it often looks like that. And it's enormous stress to work like that. So. This is one of the hardest problems that software engineer could face. It's a problem on uh, threading the needle. It's a problem on finding what is your business logic looks like. What pro what f when you have a feature, what exact feature and what exact place in your application you actually need to change. What those vagueous words mean in your code. Because code rarely reflect the actual business processes that your application has. And that's why you have this. And now you need to find what does it mean to adjust the balance? How I'm adjusting the balance for my customer? I don't know, my user. Where, where to find that? I don't know. But what we want to see is the same amount of features, but features that are segregated in a smaller chunks of, the, of information. And when we know that we need to adjust the balance or we need to make certain, certain design decisions, we know where to look for those things. We know where to find those things and how we can actually adjust it. And it's not an easy task, of course. And it's a, it's a task that can lead to, to the vertical uh, architecture where your, each individual part of your system is in dedicated part of your code base. It could be even different projects that communicate between each other. But I will talk about it a bit later. Um, as Alan Kay, I heard that if you enter the quote from Alan Kay, your presentation is way better. So I definitely find the Alan Kay quote. <laughs> um, and Alan Kay said one that uh, one of the things that software engineers uh, need to do is to find something that is a bit better than you have right now. Instead of trying to find the silver bullet that will definitely solve all your problems, you just see on your, in your application what is the worst thing that you have right now. Probably the worst thing is the one that you scare the most. If you have the part of the application that you scare about, that's the most important thing to solve right now. And this is the thing that you actually need to, to find a better way how to solve it. And I want to talk about DDD today. Um, and DDD is not the holy grail DDD that you know, it's the one that we use often. It's a database driven development. <laughs> <laughs> and database driven development is what we often do when we start an application and we have certain, certain tasks that we need to do. Something, something simple, something simple. Let's say I transfer money and I need to adjust the balance for the, for the, for the, for, for the pay and for, for buyer. Whatever. It's just, I came up with this example. And you think, uh, okay. Um, I, have a, I have users, and they have a transactions. And users probably have a balance. So I will create it, a new table. Let's say I will call it users. They have balance, whatever. Um, it works. Um, I will create transactions. Transactions connect users, and there is a certain amount. And now I need to think, OK, I have two tables. How and where I should put my logic? My logic that should represent what is actually I'm doing. I need to transfer 10% of my balance and my amount to my balance. Um, I can do it in a, in a MySQL or a Postgres directly by trigger a sort of procedure. It's kind of hard to scale with people. Maybe I, I heard this, uh, some people use callbacks, and callbacks is a silver bullet. You can use it everywhere. I will just put in a callback. Each time when we create the transaction, I will adjust, um, I will adjust the balance. I will adjust the balance for both users. It works. I made some tests. Works fine. No problems. 
Then we have another thing that we need to do. Um, those transactions that we get negative or positive, so it would be good to give, to give them a type. Just to give it a type, to have some report, to display it somewhere. Not a big deal, sure. I can create a migration, and in migration I can make this decision. Either I need to create it as a, as a loan or as a credit based on type and based on balance. But I'm, I run it in production, and suddenly I have so many complaints that balance is all over the place for people. And I see this little thing that I added to my migration. I saved it. And when I saved it, I run me callbacks for all existing transactions. And when I run all of these existing transactions, I had this. And it's a simple example. I just made it here. But usually we have 10 to 12 to 20 callbacks. Those callbacks run other callbacks. And we have a callback hell. And callback hells in immigrations and maintenance tasks, it's a bad thing to have. We, of course, can make uh, workarounds. Lots of people do that, but it's not about workarounds. In the next example, we, we, we have another part of the application. And in this part of the application, we want to make users be able to, to upload images. We have image. We have same user. They have a name. It's a, pre, it's a plain string. They can come. They may make, can make a name for their, for their images. And then user said, you know what? I really like this image. And I want to give it better description. So I will just copy paste from Wikipedia the whole text. I paste it in the input, and I will try to save it. And I cannot. And it's a bad experience. And as you grow, and as, it, as the application growing, as you like in the first steps of your, of your growing, growing curve, those bugs and those problems, they are declining the trust that you have with your customers. And declining the trust meaning that you will grow way slower. And it may end up that you may not grow at all, and you may sunset your application. So w what I mean by that? I mean by that but that your business operations and your things that your business is working on and really care about, it's not your database. It's not the thing that you, that you need to worry about when you design and when you grow your business. Database is just an artifact of your business operations. When user wants to upload something, it has a starting point, an ending point. Database and data stores, it could be not only one database, it could be multiple databases. It's just a, a legacy, it's just a history of what happened. By the database and data store, you may retrieve the history of what happened, but it's not an actual operation that happened. So thus, it's better to separate your persistence from your business logic. You can separate your persistence by many ways. Uh, in, if you're using Rails, it could be active model or active record. Um, if you use SQL, it could be SQL record. And there is lots of other ways how you can, you, if, you don't, if you want to, you can even separate it by additional layer that you place in between your application, your business logic, and your persistence. So you end up with something like that. And your persistence layer is sheltering you from the database. It's sheltering your business operation from your database. Thus, all your, all your logical things that you need to do, all that your business is supposed to do, is independent from the way how you store those artifacts. And when it's independent from what you, how you store those artifacts, you can write your test better, you can shelter it, you can make it faster, you can make sure that it actually works, and you don't need to worry about how you scale your database. And your scaling of your database is not related to your business logic. In the next example, um, what would happen if we, we have a simple task. Now we have a transaction and we have images, and we want to display some analytics about it. Pretty simple, we made up an um, analytics controller. I'm not sure how it's visible is that, but uh, usually it's a big mess of SQL. That's how it usually looks like. Uh, you, you were thinking, OK, I have a persistence layer somewhere. I don't want to put it anywhere because it's not related to any of my tables and my models. Let's say I will put it just in a controller, whatever. Yeah, I will put it in a controller. It's just one small analytical thing. I will put it there. No one will worry. Um, I will have some reviewers. My friend will can review it, and we can approve it and ship it. Ship it, um, then we have another thing. You know, the one table that you made there, it's really cool. We really want to have it in CSV or XML format because we need to share it with our executive and they need to see how fast we're growing. 
you think, yeah, sure, I can do it. I can have a small buttons there. Let's upload it, download it. Um, and you sure how visible is that? I made a, another slide, which is a bit better. better. But it's not really re important how it's written. It's uh, the concept that it represents. So you added two things. Uh, you made it to CSV, to XML. You want to filter if it's XML. You want to filter the empty strings or whatever you need to filter for XML. XML could be really tricky. It really depends on the schema. So all of your logics go there because, well, you haven't made a decision where this logic should go. So it go where? The where it was made it last time in a controller. And it could be a really big thing that you end up at, at the very end. It could have like lots and lots of like small conditional not related to your initial task. And then your business said, you know, we have a new awesome marketing tool that we want to have. And they really would like to have this data. Can we send it to them? And you're like, uh, not really. <laughs> so this means that Ideally, you need to segregate your interfaces from your business logic. Because the moment that you have certain requirement to do, like to display certain data in certain format, this represents a certain business value that this thing, this particular thing, is for your, for your business. And thus, separating those interfaces could pay you back once you need to provide this, this particular inter business thing to other interfaces like CSV, like XML, like webhooks. So you end up here where you have lots of interfaces that all point into your business logic. I will expand on this paradigm a bit, a bit farther later. Of course I promise that you want to grow and you want to grow fast and it's supposed to be an easy thing but it's not an easy to make it, to make it easy because simple is not easy. It's really hard to make something simple because you need to invest time and you need to invest your knowledge into making things simpler. I will talk about a bit how you can do that. How is a very important, important thing because if you don't say how, people don't know how to do that. They, they see the problem but they don't know the solution. An ideal situation that we know, it, it's not me, <laughs> uh, in ideal situation, we want to grow with time, and we want to grow our features, and our complexity would be linear, at least somehow linear. Um, complexity is the, is the it's not only amount of objects that you have in your system, it's also a communication between those objects also play a big part in a complexity. And thus, I, usually we end up in a situation like this when the amount of features over time, the not allowing us to do anything more than that. Each new feature takes ages to develop, and we don't know why. Let's dig down to the rabbit hole uh, and uh, see how we can simplify, at least a bit simplify, this problem for our future and ongoing development. And the main thing here is that all other things are super simple. They're making web UI, JSON interface, or XML. It's a mechanical task. Uh, filtering XML is a mechanical task. Making a persistent layer easy and understandable is a mechanical task. Those little errors on the bottom, they basically represent some, it, it may not even exist if you don't need it, but it represents the data flow that you need to send from one data store to another one for whatever re reason you need for some reporting or from other stuff or some backups. Those, those small scripts, they're not related to your business. They're related to your infrastructure. And those infrastructure things, they could be complex to grow, to grow, your, to grow your infrastructure, but it's not related to your business directly. It's more related to how you grow your application in a form of servers and in form of data flows. The juicy part of this uh, diagram is the business logic. It's the thing that rarely people know how to, ex how to work with. And um, I remember back in the days, everyone, everywhere was uh, fat controllers and thin models. And people were like, oh, we have so big controllers. It's all over the place. It's like th thousands of lines, and we don't know what to do with them. Then someone came and said, you know what? Thin controller and fat model will solve all your problems in the world. And you're like, oh, nice. They will fruit everything in a, in, a, in a model. And now, and then you see all those callback health problems. And you see that there are certain concepts that are intermixed with each other. And you probably accumulated lots and lots of 
mixings all over the place and you mix in p things around and you don't know what the objects are representing anymore. And then someone came and said, you know what? Everything should be thin, but we add in services for to your life. And everything became a service. Even the things that not a service not right, uh, at that point became a service. If things that represent certain business value, certain data flow, certain data that you sent between your modules, it became a service, which is always not true, uh, often not true. So let's see what your business logic often looks like. Um, you probably have few God classes, probably one, maybe two. God class, it's the uh, one that's uh, tickling around like 1,000 or 2,000 lines, and one change in this class, do, putting down the whole application. And the main architecture in your project says, don't go there and don't look back. Like, you don't make any changes there. Just, just don't. <laughs> and um, you, pro you wanna you wanna fix that and you wanna change that and that's what I'm encouraging you to, to do. Each time when you see problem, love your problem, love your problem and try to understand the problem and then try to fix your problem, because this will help other people and it will help you grow with time. We can apply certain principles. Uh, all architecture and software engineering, those problems they are not, not new and the solution to those problems they are not new. So when you design and when you see that there is a certain certain parts of the application require your attention, you need, you can apply first you can apply certain principles to make it easy and clearer what's go, what's exactly going on in each individual object. One of these principles is high cohesion. Cohesion stands for the understanding of the um, objects about themselves. Each object should be meaningful enough to justify the existence, but not have lots of meanings inside that each individual part of it would be different one from another. So it should represent one idea, not many ideas. That's what your project is. And if you apply it, your God, God classes and your God objects, they usually represent lots of things. They could, be, they could mix those cohesive um, ideas together. And you need to thread, in, thread a needle and understand what part is related to, to what other part and slice this and slide this big object into smaller pieces and use the smaller pieces where it's important. So you end up something like that. You see how it's simple. I just made a slide and you're done. But usually, it's of course, it's a way harder problem. You actually need to dive in, you spend time, and make sure that you, you fix in the right thing. Next principle is uh, you want to make it low couple, uh, low, low, lower coupling. And lower coupling means that you don't have lots of dependencies for your objects. It's decoupled from other objects as far as it can be. Because having lots of dependency meaning that you have lots of things that, you wor that your object is responsible for. And it's, it's usually a bad thing to have. So you apply some decoupling principles and it's still kind of a lot of things to do, a lot of, a lots of things going on. There is few other things that you can work on, and uh, you can apply uh, you can apply other principles. Um, one of the I like, for example, is uh, dependency direction. It meaning that when you design in your system, you will still have the modules that are more important than others. There are things that are really represent some core ideas, and the things that are there's a supporting ideas or some objects that are utility classes that you need to transform data from one from one type to another one and in this in these cases your higher level modules they shouldn't depend on lower level modules your lower lower level modules you can think about it as duct typing your if you if you familiar with this idea so your main object is not dependent on your objects that are coming into your main objects those smaller objects should be dependent on the interface that your main object is giving you and thus you you make a right direction of your dependencies and at this point, it still could be a really, really messy. You can have like thousands of thousands of thousands of objects. Each of them, maybe in general, wouldn't be hard to work with. But as a general concept and general ideas, you don't know what, who is responsible in a general way to what other things. And that's, you need to find, and you need to bind your business context. You need to find the objects that are coming together and updating together. Um, there is lots of techniques from uh, scrolling through GitHub or SVN and finding f what objects were coming to were most often changed together so you can find those objects. 
or you can start writing a dependency in the app and see what is the, what is dependent what kind of dependencies your object has and by finding those uh, business context you can find those objects that are important to what other parts of your system and at this point you can already kind of slow down this is already good enough to start working towards the ba better things you already know if you s if those sl on left side right side and in the middle those things represent certain ideas and you and your team probably know that ideally in your application you can have a different different folder for each of those concepts it's still same application but it, on a conceptual level this application now has different business contexts and each business context represent a idea about it it could be like one is analytic context another one it could be sales context a third one could be imaginary or something like that the one thing that we work with images that we talked about before but you can go you can go farther and you can separate them in a three different business contexts and fr and essentially in three different applications but you always need to remember about Metcalf law Metcalf law says that your your complexity of the system it's not really a, a correlated to amount of objects that you have but also correlated to amount of connections that objects have between themselves it may solve you some problem separating things in a smaller pieces but it will also create you another problems that comes to that comes with that there are some solutions in the market that are uh, on uh, in our community right now that can help you and that can grow your application with time um, if it's if you have a small application maybe something like a plain ruby file will work probably until it size 5000 of tile of lines you can work with it within one file i've seen people done that i didn't like that uh, <laughs> uh, but it's probably work for some people if it go m more than that it's becoming a huge pain and uh, some other things like Sinatra or grape can can fit in this particular small small uh, in this particular small se segment then of course it's uh, rails and a new application Hanami that I that I like um, and I really like that people are d diving into that um, and uh, if it's bigger than that you looking on the, on the solutions that are not rails anymore and it's probably not even Hanami anymore you're trying to grow the concepts rails and Hanami and trailblazer and Ryerby those are the concepts that are universal soldiers they are made for 80 percent of the time but you still have 20 percent of the time and you still have a uh, solution that you need to build for yourself and where in in this particular case they may fail you and no one in your in um, no one in the world knows better your application than you are <laughs> uh, knows better application than you are um, that's why you have the most contacts and that's why you may build your business logic better because when you evaluate those 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 additional things those if you want to bring trailblazer to your application or you want to bring dryer B to your application you need to think about it as a dependencies and when you think about dependencies if you wanna if you ever if you go in a, in a supermarket and you want to have something sweet you don't buy a cake right you usually buy a, buy a small piece of a cake if you buy a huge cake you probably regret about that. You regret about that with time. So you buy a small cake. And don't buy a cake if you want a small piece. And ideally, in your engineering, you need to end up with a situation where the only one condition is the one that you're choosing the object that you're using right now in each particular situation. And uh, this the end with the Aaron Patterson quote. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for uh, using without asking. <laughs> um, and that's it. You can ask me a question if you have any. And as I said, I love your problems. Talk to me afterwards. Thank you so much, Alex. Okay, any questions on the talk or otherwise? Any guys, come on. Uh, oh, there you go, of course. Tim. Are there any books or places that you could recommend for sort of learning that change in mindset? Um, I would say lots of DDD books. Um, they are really wag you sometimes, and it's like a big books, now 800 of, uh, of pages. But they can help to build their mindset that will think about objects and businesses instead of just throw something in those files and forget about it. Um, I like the old books about four 
pattern guys and girls, uh, but uh, pop patterns of object-oriented software. Uh, lots of Sandy Matz books and uh, seminars, of course. Um, Gary Brunstein, a few talks from Gary Brunstein was good. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's a good one. That's a lot of resources. Any more questions? Yep, sure. Quite often, your existing application will have a lot of complexity, uh, and when you start developing an application, you just uh, go with the flow and you uh, putting a lot of pieces together and a lot of requests as they come by. You know, so uh, say you've reached a point in your application where uh, you've developed a lot of uh, developed a lot, and you want to roll back a bit and start using this approach to uh, smooth things over. So. Uh, how do you uh, is this uh, with this principle or would this uh, idea apply or how do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, uh, those idea ideas apply as for the ex existing application, as for new one. When you build the new one, you it's it's way easier than refactoring the old legacy systems. I refactored lots of old legacy systems. All of that is a it's a big pain, but you can soften the pain. So. You, uh, by applying application, uh, by applying this, um, if you have a legacy system, first thing that you need to do is build a churn diagram. Churn diagram means that how many times the file was changed and what is the complexity of the file. In this diagram, you meet a, an axis and Y and see those files that are changing most often and most complex one. And you start from them because they are the most problematic one in your application right now. And then you slowly picking in and slowly trying to make this refactor and refa green red refactoring. And like try to make tests. And so if you have tests, often you don't have tests. That's why you need to build tests first. <laughs> uh, and you're trying to understand the context of you of the things that each particular system does. And then eventually. Fortunately for you, and hopefully for you, you will be able to make it simpler. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I think I think the uh, I think the uh, like you mentioned. I mean, it's 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 uh, uh, like you know, if you if you want to soften the blow, it's still going to take off, take a lot of your effort to you know uh, research, uh, look back at your code, and see how you can break it down a bit into clusters and stuff. So. Sure. Is that Step by step. Any more guys? Come on. Don't be shy. There you go, Louis. When do you know that? Uh, when do you get a feeling that you have uh, over architected uh, an application? Uh, try not to over architect. Try not to solve problems that doesn't exist. If you feel and you see that you you have problems that exist, and you see that certain features are starting harder to develop, and certain things are really, and you scared of certain parts of the application, that's probably a start of when you need to do architect, like when you need to refactor. Before that, not try to invent the perfect plane. Just make it good enough. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any more? Last question. Come on, we'll take one more. No more. All right. That's it. Thank you so much, Alex. We appreciate it.